Good morning. How many noticed there's uh, some differences in the lobby when you came in? So all kinds of things are being moved around right now. So I think you knew that my office had become a nursing mother's room. And now the nursing mother, the, the receptionist's office has become, now let me get this right. <laughs> so the, wherever the nursing mother's room was, that's the receptionist's office now. If you're wondering where the nursing mother's room is, it's where the kitchen used to be. <laughs> and, uh, and you probably noticed that where the receptionist's office was, there's just some tables set up in there. We've had some folks that tell us they really liked that. And uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It will be one week because the walls are coming down to that uh, this week. Uh, just really grateful for the progress that's being made. And I'm really grateful for just the way you're managing that. We know that it can be a little bit inconvenient or sometimes uh, not especially attractive to come into a place that's being kind of reconstructed. And, and uh, so I'm very grateful for the effort that you're making and, uh, and for the way that you continue to invite, friend, invite friends and family to be part of our gatherings today. So we're moving forward. It's a good thing. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about a, a conversation uh, that's a very private conversation. And I want to set up the story by looking in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and it says this. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say... You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Uh, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit from the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. It's a fascinating story, and um, so let me start with this. There's something that we actually all have in common this morning, every one of us. Uh, and uh, it's not our income. We don't all make the same amount of money. We don't all have the same body type. We don't all have the same IQ. We don't all have the same ethnic background. We don't all have the same personality or the same experiences or the same opportunities. In fact, we might not even all have the same faith. It's possible that you are visiting with a friend or family and the whole faith issue is still in question for you. We still have something in common. And what we have in common is that we all have sinned, every one of us. And there's lots of reasons, uh, there's lots of ways to sin, but a lot of reasons to sin too. Sometimes we just didn't know better, and so we did something that we should not have done or failed to do something that we should. Sometimes we just want something really bad, and we're willing to take shortcuts, break or bend rules in order to get it. Sometimes we're just afraid of what might happen, and so we do things we know that we shouldn't. Sometimes we just don't want pain, and so we'll exercise options that we think will reduce pain, or maybe numb us from it. Uh, the, the point is that we all have sinned. And I don't know a topic that creates more frustration and mockery in our culture than talking about sin. It really frustrates a lot of people. Some consider it just an antiquated idea held over by people who want to exercise control. And so the idea to cause some, call something as sin is just silly. I mean... I mean, isn't the adult thing is, well, if, if it's right for you, then it's right for you. 
And if it's right for me, then it's right for me. And, and I won't impose my rules on you, and you won't impose your rules on me. Well, there's some challenges built into that system. What if somebody does something to you that you don't think is right? Because on that model, if they think it's right, it's okay. And by the way, when we write our own rules, we change them as we go along. We do. We, we kind of, well, I know that's what I used to think, but now, and so we, we change. We need a standard, a, a guideline of, of options that are inbounds and out of bounds that aren't just established by our circumstance or our own intellect. So there's a lot of people consider it silly, and then there's some people who just, they get very angry. They consider conversations about sin an attempt to reject other people, uh, to dehumanize other people, to create distance with other people. And by the way, I don't know uh, how our culture manages. When we talk about issues that are sinful things, our culture uses shame. Please hear this. Our culture uses shame more than any religious institution. It just, it, you don't just get to step out of bounds. If it's currently out of vogue, they will say things about you that are far more than that was not appropriate. They say a lot more than that. Now, if we were to go outside today and there was some monstrous predator, a, a roaring, raging, hungry lion, we would all do our best to steer clear of it. But when it comes to sin, we don't tend to recognize sin as the predator that it is. And by and large, because it camouflages itself so well, we do tend to notice it in others more easily than we notice it in ourselves. So what is sin? Is it just a breaking of a rule? Is it just doing something that's offensive to someone? Is it failure to live up to an obligation or omitting to do something? Well, the Bible gives us a more nuanced and richer definition of this, and it comes out of this story, and what we discover is, is that sin actually leads to death. Sin leads to death. Adam and Eve were created, and they were placed in paradise, which I'm pretty sure meant that the weather that we're having today is not the weather that they had in the garden. I'm just guessing that. I mean, you have to admit, our weather is not boring, right? I was shoveling yesterday afternoon, I had an umbrella last night, and who knows what I'm going to be going later today. I mean, I really feel sorry for those people who live in San Diego, California. Just the sheer monotony of 82 and sunny every day is almost unbearable. It's unbelievable. Adam and Eve lived in a beautiful place, and they ate delicious food, and they had meaningful work, and they were literally made for each other. What could be better? And just one prohibition. It was one tree, must not be eaten from. And God told them that if you eat from that tree, that you would die. And this is what everybody interprets. Everybody interprets that as though God is punishing them for breaking the rule. And what God is saying is that it's a consequence. So we just had our granddaughter around Christmas up to our house and we had to do something we haven't had to do in a very long time and let's put all these child safety things that make it very difficult to get into certain cupboards and cabinets and drawers and doors and uh, uh, it's kept me out of a couple of things let's just say that <laughs> and uh, you know there's some things we don't want her to get to and drink what, what person would say to a toddler, if you drink that, I will kill you? And that's what people think God is doing all the time. He didn't say, if you eat of that tree, I will kill you. He said, if you eat of that tree, you will die from it. He's not punishing, he's trying to protect. And, and the question is, so did they die? Was it like poison and they bit into it and they just fell over? And it, it seems as though at least the, the capacity for aging was inserted into the human genome. So we're not sure what it would have been like if they hadn't eaten of it. There's a lot of unknowns about this. And, and, and so was God exaggerating or no? Something did die immediately and had more to do with their relationship because God doesn't consider life just to be your pulse. It's a lot more than that. So Adam and Eve partook of this tree, and immediately they became something they'd never been before, and that was self-conscious. Not, not self-aware. Self-conscious. Before that, the Bible said they were naked and not ashamed. 
They had nothing to prove. They had nothing to hide. They were comfortable with who they were, and they were comfortable with who they were with. They were aware without being awkward. Can you imagine living like that? And so sin inserted something that brought death to that relationship. There's another thing. Uh, sin also creates an impulse to hide. It doesn't just hurt us. We tend to hide. And, and so they start covering up. Um, uh, consuming the fruit from that tree caused them to see themselves differently than they had before. And because they saw themselves differently, they actually saw each other differently. And they felt exposed and they felt vulnerable. And so they started pulling down leaves and weaving them together and wearing them in aprons. And so they, they start covering up. And covering up isn't just about fig leaves. There's a lot of way people try to cover up in their life. And then they don't just cover up, they run from. When they hear the voice of God coming into the garden, when they hear him in the garden, they, they create distance between them and him. Adam and Eve ran and hid among the trees. Now, when you ask them, they said, because we are naked, except they weren't anymore. They had fig leaf aprons now. So why do they say that? Because somehow we all know that nothing is hidden from his sight. It doesn't matter how we cover up. It's not enough. We have to keep our distance. And I'm telling you, we've created a forest of trees to hide behind. And we've created a lot of distance. And we don't say, I don't feel comfortable being in the presence of God. We just say, well, I've got a lot of work to do. And I've got a lot of commitments. And I've got a lot of friends. And I've got a lot of family obligations. And I just... We have a forest of trees now. And, and, the, and then they run, they create distance, and then they do something else. It's another form of hiding. It's blaming. If I can blame you for something, then I'm not responsible for it. I'm, I'm hiding my part of this. And so they just begin to blame each other. It's interesting. When you read through Scripture, Scripture is unflinching in telling the truth about the, the protagonist in any story. They, they just It just... There's no effort to spare the reputation of anyone. And so in this story, there's no threat, there's no coercion, there's no violence. There's just a subtle accusation, and that is that maybe God wants less for your life than you would want if you had the choice. And you'd be surprised how many people still fall for that line. And they try something or take something that they know is a little bit out of bounds, but they want to know for themselves. God wasn't withholding wisdom and knowledge from them. They could have asked him anything. They didn't. And then we can hide through rationalizing just by saying, well, it wasn't that bad, and everybody does it, and others have done worse, and besides, they deserved it. And we're hiding the fact by minimizing that we know what we did is out of bounds, and that's the point. Every time you hide, every time you hide, Every time you hide, you know you were out of bounds. That's why you hide. So God comes to Adam and Eve, and he comes to us in our failures too, not because he's looking for a reason to disqualify us, but because he's relentless in his attempt to rescue us. It's fascinating. He asks questions he already knows the answer to, not because he's a prosecutor trying to trap the witness on the stand, but because he wants to give them an opportunity to stop hiding. Just stop hiding. Why is that important? Because humans need to be seen. Humans need to be seen. We don't manage life well when we don't or when we feel invisible. When we're not seen, we feel like we are less. When we are overlooked, we feel like we are undervalued. When we are ignored, we feel like we are unloved. You have to be seen to be loved. It's when we're fully seen that we feel like something is happening that matters. And God created us to love and to be loved. And when we're hiding, we just feel fake, like we're pretending to be something we're not. Or we, we feel stupid. Maybe it doesn't happen to you. happens to me. I've noticed that some people just, it, life seems to work better for them. 
Things seem to come more easily to them. And if I believe even half of the stuff that's on Facebook, everybody's beautiful, their life is meaningful, it's unbelievable. I, I was actually at a beach one time with my wife. We were on vacation, and there was three women and some small children who walked onto the beach. They walked onto the beach, and I thought, oh, they're here for the day. And then if you don't have small children of your own, you have mixed feelings about that. I wonder how this is going to go. And so they put down their towels, and they had someone come in with a camera, and they took some pictures of them at the beach, and they posted their pictures online, and then all got up and they left. They didn't really spend the day at the beach. They did a photo shoot at the beach. <laughs> if you're a parent, you know there's a difference. We can feel stupid. We can feel unaccepted. And, and here's the thing. We have all had someone see something in us that we wish they hadn't noticed, and we've had them connect it to some form of laughter or poking fun at. It feels judgmental, and it feels like mockery, and sometimes it even feels like betrayal. We have all been shamed. We have all been belittled. But the people who love us don't refuse to call those things to our attention. They're not blind. They just call it to our attention for a different reason. They want something better for us. They don't want us to settle for less. So they'll call some things to our attention, which brings us to the idea of confessing. And confession is how we stop hiding. Confession is how we stop hiding. It's the way we allow ourselves to be seen. The goal of true spirituality is not to do a better job hiding and pretending our secret struggles. The goal of true spirituality is to get better at disclosing our secret struggles. That's real spirituality. Unconfessed sin just robs us of joy and makes us feel weak and makes us feel like we're under a heavy burden and like we're fragile. It's not enough for someone to tell us you're not that bad. It's not enough for someone to tell us what happened didn't matter. It's not enough to be told that you are right. We long to hear you are forgiven. We've settled for phrases that don't make any difference. So in this series, we've been talking about you know, how could you spend five minutes a day that can make a difference in a conversation with God? So here's some recommendations. Conversation with God. If you're going to spend some time coming out of hiding with God, the first thing I would tell you is identify what you are hiding. Identify what you are hiding. This is the easiest and obvious one. Like if, you, if you told a lie, why did, you, why did you say something that wasn't true? Why did you insinuate information that you knew wasn't accurate? All right? You know, just... You, you actually did it. You said something that you shouldn't have said. You did something that you shouldn't have done. You, you tried to hide it up. That, that, that's the obvious thing. But here's the second thing, and that is to go under and find the why. Why did I do that? So often we stop with the what. Well, I told another lie. Yes, but why did you tell that lie? What was driving that decision? What were you afraid would happen, or what did you hope you would gain? The why is a much more challenging question to ask. And here's what you should know is we have a terrifying ability to come up with a good reason for doing a bad thing. Sometimes we just didn't trust someone. Sometimes we didn't think that God was going to offer another opportunity. Sometimes we think that if I don't get this on my own, it's never going to happen for me. So just name the what, but also name the why. Uh, if you've been raised in a Catholic background, you know that confessional is part of the, it's part of the tradition. In fact, if, if you were raised Catholic, you know that it's expected you go at least once a year. And uh, they encourage even more than that. And some people have gone monthly or weekly, and there's some that even go daily. And I was talking to a priest one time, and he told me there was this individual who, was, who kind of said to him, I'm just tired of coming in and, and repeating the same old sins. And, and the priest looked at him and said, what, are you trying to find new sins to do? Like, what's the, what's the point of the conversation? If we don't start dealing with the why, the what will always be repeated. And then this is the surprising thing that I think will really help us because often we feel stuck when we're trying to be seen, and that is to turn your focus on what God has done for you. So Adam and Eve had sinned. They'd hid from each other. They hid from God. And God noticed that the effort that they had to cover themselves was quite temporary. I don't know what the, 
the average life expectancy is of a fig leaf that's been plucked from a tree and weaved together and worn as an apron. But God actually made more permanent garments for Adam and Eve from the skins of an animal. So why does he do that? Is it because he's embarrassed by how they look? No. It's because he knows they are. And he's trying to make them feel comfortable spending time with him again. You know, God came in our world, and he came to be seen. That's literally what the word incarnation means, that God takes on flesh. And Jesus showed us what God was like in every way, all the time. And even, not, not only in ministry, but even when he was accused falsely, and he was arrested, and he was tried, and he was tortured, and he was crucified, and he stripped and hung naked on a cross, even there, even there, especially there, he does not hide. On the cross, he acknowledges when he is thirsty. He acknowledges when he feels isolated and forsaken and abandoned. He prays. Says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit because there's no control left of this situation any longer. He comes to be fully seen and he shows us it's always a mistake to only focus on our own sins. And that's not all we do in confession. We focus on the work that God has done for us. Our sins are not that interesting. God's work is what is interesting. Sin is diminishing, and it's dehumanizing, and it's dull. Sins may happen every day, but they are not new. But the Bible does say his mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. If you're willing to start a conversation where you come out of hiding, that's where you discover how good he is, how gracious he is, and what he wants for your life, which is way more than we have settled for. Let's bow our heads this morning. I am very aware that having conversations with anyone, including God, about what we got wrong is not comfortable. There's another kind of conversation about sin that is as or even more uncomfortable than that, and that is not just about the sins done by us, but the sins done to us and the wounds it created in us and the scars that we bear from that. I heard a story recently about a young man who, because of the physical abuse he received at home, would wear three t-shirts to school. That usually the blood stopped showing through by the time he got to a third t-shirt. The scars were real and so was the shame. And here's the most fascinating thing about the creation story and the story in Genesis. And that is there is shame in the Garden of Eden, but it's not imposed by God and it's not used by God. He's doing everything he can to rescue people from it. So maybe the wounds are deep and the scars are obvious and you have spent a lot of time and a great deal of energy trying to hide those wounds and those scars from other people because your assumption is if they see that, they will leave me. And I can't make a promise about all the people in your life, but I can make a promise if you come to God, if you start that private conversation with him, it changes everything. Everything. So, Father, we're not trying to explain or rationalize or minimize or blame. We're just going to start an honest conversation with you today. When we've noticed something where we've stepped out of bounds or failed to meet an expectation that, that we had some responsibility for, we're just going to name it. We're, we're not going to hide it. And we're going to think about it and try to figure out what, what the why was and all of that. But we're not stopping there. You showed us how to be visible. 
Help us be that with you and with each other in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand this morning.